One of the most important ways to look at patients is as organisms that age. And all organisms that reproduce asymmetrically must age. We certainly do. Why do we age? Must we age? These are both very important questions, and the evolutionary theory of aging has given us good answers to them. Aging is the decrease with age in intrinsic ability to survive and reproduce. And I'd like to emphasize these words in the sentence. It's the decrease with age in the intrinsic ability to survive and reproduce. So we're focusing on things that are happening inside the organism as it ages that make it less able to survive and reproduce. It is a byproduct of selection for reproductive performance. It's not selected directly. And it explains both our susceptibility to degenerative disease and why it is that we must die. All organisms with asymmetric reproduction must age. The first insight in the evolutionary theory of aging is that selection on age-specific rates of survival and reproduction decreases with age. So selection is stronger on the young than it is on the old. This was stated as follows by Peter Medawar. The force of natural selection weakens with increasing age, even in a theoretically immortal population, provided only that it is exposed to real hazards of mortality. If a genetic disaster happens late enough in an, in, in an individual life, its consequences may be completely unimportant. So to see this, visualize the distribution of ages of your ancestors at the time that they gave birth to your lineage. Think about how old was your mother when she gave birth to you? How old was your grandmother when she gave birth to your mother? Do that going back hundreds of generations into the past. Construction, construct a frequency histogram in your mind and you will see that it's dominated by the young. It is not dominated by the old. Evolution is a numbers game. Things that happen frequently are important. Things that happen rarely are not important. Reproduction in the young is important, and reproduction in the old is less, less important, and survival in the old becomes insignificant. Medawar saw that even if organisms do not age, there are fewer old than young, for there is some mortality, often a lot, that occurs for reasons that are unrelated to age and aging. So mortality just due to accidents can eliminate people even if they're in good shape. And therefore, the number of people in a population that are old must be less than the number that are young. Evolution is a numbers game. Selection is stronger on events that happen frequently, reproduction in the young, than on those that happen less frequently, survival in the old. So that's the first insight. The second insight comes from George Williams. He added an important genetic effect that we call antagonistic pleiotropy. We've already discussed it a bit with regard to reproduction in Framingham and cancer risk. In antagonistic pleiotropy, a gene has a positive effect on traits early in life and a negative effect late in life. The pleiotropy part means that the gene is having an effect on two or more traits. And the antagonistic part means that it's plus in one set and negative in the other set. Another idea is mutation accumulation. That would mean that the gene was neutral early in life, but it was having a negative effect late in life. So it's not really being expressed early in life, and when it is expressed late in life, its effect is negative. There is a lot of evidence that it supports the existence of antagonistic pleiotropy, and there's very little evidence suggesting the importance of mutation accumulation, although there is some. One reason for this may be that there are very few genes that are only expressed in a narrow range of ages. Now, how does selection work on lifespan from a life history perspective? A change in selection that lengthens life is going to be one that increases the relative contribution of fitness of adults and decreases that of juveniles. So if you look at that basically as a change that makes adults worth more and juveniles worth less, then it makes sense that such a change in selection would include lower adult mortality rates, makes adults worth more, and higher juvenile mortality rates, makes juveniles worth less. And in contrast, if adult mortality rates increase, then organisms should evolve more rapid aging. And an easy way 
to conceptualize that is why should you invest in maintaining a body that will be dead anyway for some other reason over which you have no control? Better to invest in reproduction while you can. So the extrinsic selection pressures are interacting with the internal trade-offs to shift organisms from having long lives in which they have delayed reproduction and perhaps reproduce more slowly to having short lives where they try to pack reproduction in right at the beginning. Now what are the causes of aging? We'll go through this at several levels. At one level, aging is a byproduct of selection for reproductive performance. It arises through the evolutionary accumulation of many genes that have positive or neutral effects on fitness components early in life and negative effects on fitness components late in life. So the old are paying for the beauty of the young. Because organisms are bundles of genetically variable trade-offs, because aging is a byproduct, and because patients differ genetically and developmentally, we expect aging to have many causes that differ among individuals. Recall the last few lectures. We know that patients are genetically different. We know that they've had different developmental histories. We know that they contain trade-offs. We know that the contributions to those trade-offs are different between individuals, and we know that aging is the product of selection operating on a trade-off. That means that individual patients are going to be dying for different reasons. If we fix one problem, another one would emerge. This appears to be true. First, we, re we reduce the mortality that's caused by infectious disease. We did that with vaccines and antibiotics. Then cardiovascular disease emerged as a major killer. Then we improved the prevention and treatment of cardiovascular disease. And now patients are dying more frequently of cancer and Alzheimer's. This cycle appears to be endless. It's not yet clear that the process has an end. In other words, built in to the bodies of people who were aging, back before the demographic transition, there were susceptibilities that would have allowed them to die more frequently of cardiovascular disease and Alzheimer's or cancer, but they were being covered up by the high mortality rate of infectious disease. Eliminate the infectious disease, these other processes emerge. They are probably tied to selection for reproductive performance. Tom Kirkwood extended George Williams' idea a bit by relating repair explicitly to fitness. He called it the disposable soma theory. The idea is that investment in repair should evolve to a level that is lower than what is needed for indefinite life. So this is a picture of that central idea. On the x-axis, we have investment in repair. On the y-axis, we have fitness. For all of the reasons that I've just discussed, fitness is going to be very low when there's no repair. It's going to increase with, as repair increases. So as survival increases, this will allow organisms to survive until they reproduce. But then once they start reproducing, it is going to uh, create a condition where the population can be invaded by antagonistic pleiotropic genes. And what that means is that further investment in repair is going to be trading off with reproduction. So organisms can survive uh, to a given age in this blue space. If they could break through past this point, they could have indefinite survival. In other words, the idea is that there's no intrinsic limit in biological materials and repair processes on how long organisms can survive. The reason that they age is that their optimal level of repair, which is giving them their optimal contribution to future generations, is set at a lower level than that which is required for indefinite life. Now, who should age? August Weismann saw back in 1882 that asymmetrically reproducing organisms are the ones 
that should age, but that was forgotten. George Williams suggested that sexual organisms that had a separation of soma, which was mortal, from germline, which was immortal, were the ones that should age. John Maynard Smith extended that to plants by saying that sexual organisms that return to a single cell stage at some point in their life cycle should age, which also happens in plants, and plants do senesce. Then uh, Linda Partridge and Nick Barton uh, noted that any asymmetrically reproducing organism in which the mother, which is older, can be distinguished from the daughter, which is younger, should age. So this is a rediscovery of August Weissman's idea, and they did it independently. I think they were correct. It is symmetrically reproducing organism that should not age. So here is a picture of a symmetrically reproducing organism. And when division is perfectly symmetrical, it's impossible for selection to distinguish between mother and daughter. Both are equally intact or equally damaged, and the reproductive payoff of improving the maintenance of both is equal. An asymmetrically organism, however, does age. Here's an example, Colobacter. This is a stalked bacterium, and it has an interesting life cycle. The adult sets down on the substrate, and it, this is the swarmer cell sitting down as an adult. It then grows, and it has an age at first reproduction when it divides and produces a swarmer cell. This is the dispersing progeny going off. It has an interval between reproductive events, and it has an age at maturation. Now, when the payoff of maintaining the mother cell becomes smaller than maintaining the daughter cell, so the mother is reproduced, the daughter is not yet started, then aging will evolve, and it will evolve as a cost of reproductive performance. And when we measure reproductive output in Colobacter, it does decline with age. So this is reproductive output in cells per hour. This is the age of the stocked cells here. The three lines are three different replicates, and you can see that there's a very consistent decline in reproductive output with age. So this was the first observation that bacteria senesce. What are the mechanisms that mediate aging? Well, one of them is associated with energy flow. So a byproduct of energy flow is protons. They leak out of mitochondria. They bind with water in the cytoplasm and they cause oxidative damage. Increases in growth and metabolic rate cause energy flow to increase. So things that grow more rapidly and are eating more are also producing more proton leakage and causing more cellular damage. Some candidate genes that mediate, growth, that mediate this kind of response are growth hormone and the insulin-like growth factor. And mutations in these pathways have been investigated in mice, flies, and worms. And some of those mutations increase lifespan in these model organisms up to 70%. Now, humans are neither mice nor worms nor flies. Similar mutations in homologous genes do not lengthen life, except possibly in one cluster of dwarves who live on an island in Croatia. And these people are affected in bad ways. They remain prepubescent, they remain the size of a seven-year-old, and they are chronically cold and sleepy. So this is not a candidate for gene therapy in humans, at least not in any simple way, because mutations in these genes have consequences for several traits that are quite negative. Now, could we select ourselves to live longer? Is immortality plausible? It's an interesting question and it's one in which people are investing. Well, the heritability of lifespan in humans is about 0.25, which is not large, but is significant, and it does permit a response to selection. If there were strong selection, the response could be fairly rapid. One could carry out that kind of selection simply by delaying age at first birth, progressively. So, Everyone would agree, okay, we're not going to have any children until we're 25, and then after we had come into equilibrium at that point, we could say, oh, now we're not going to have any children until we're 30, and let that come into equilibrium, 
and then 35, and then 40, and so forth, just increasing the delay until the first child appears. The survivors would then become healthier and they'd become more vigorous at ages that are currently considered very old. So 40-year-olds would then start to develop the physiology of 18-year-olds. The upper limit on average lifespan would probably be reached at several hundred years. And that is the lifespan that could evolve if we could eliminate all intrinsic sources of mortality, if everyone eventually died in accidents. It's not immortality, but it's considerably greater than what we currently have. This is an absolute fantasy. It could never be implemented because many people would cheat and they would reproduce early. So it might sound good, but it won't work. So to summarize, aging evolves in any organism that reproduces asymmetrically, and that appears to include all organisms. It does so for two reasons. First, selection intensity declines with age when mothers can be distinguished from daughters, and genes that improve early performance at the cost of late survival cannot be kept out of the population and accumulate over evolutionary time. Thus, aging is not directly selected. It is a byproduct of selection for reproductive performance. The evolutionary theory of aging has been repeatedly tested in several organisms and frequently confirmed. It appears to be pretty solid.